So, so one of the things when we were getting the precursors to Extinction Rebellion together was that enormity of thinking about economics and democracy. And I think what I realised was that actually it's not down to any group to decide what democratic system you should have or what economic system you should have. Because how can any one person or one small group be really, really convinced this is exactly the right way of doing it? And there are different experts around who can talk about these things. And it's always just struck me that what you want to do is create a moment where there's um, interest and um, real power with the people and then you can have a grown-up conversation about you know what form of democracy do we want what form of economic system do we want and I don't know if you know Kate but I was obsessed with economics for three years I was uh, studying it I, I once met Steve, Professor Steve Keen and I told him I'd had him in the bath several times <laughs> Because <laughs> I used to watch economics videos and it took me like three years. I, I put this video together, it's online, but um, and it was basically if you don't really understand economics, here's a really simple thing there are alternatives, yes. it's the first point. And you know, your donut economics is something that I think anybody can get their heads around. It's worth saying something about it. And that's the, that's the plan. I mean, I'm here because I take my profession as an economist very seriously, right? Go back to the ancient Greek roots, ikos nomos. It means the art of household management. Yeah. Well, if you're an economist, we're no longer in ancient Greek when the household was, you know, a little estate. And how do you manage your wife, your slaves, and do you let your wife run the books? We're no longer in Athens where the economy was a city state. We're no longer in Adam Smith's day when the economy was the nation state. We're here in a planetary household. We are the generation that realizes we are a planetary household. So any self-respecting 21st century economist has to start with a planetary household. And economics should start with understanding how this planetary household thrives, the hydrological cycle, the carbon cycle all the living earth systems and how her inhabitants thrive and the nature of people that we're not deeply competitive and only self-interested but also profoundly collaborative yeah. and collective with the most social of all animals so i think all economics has to start there and everybody gets that yeah i know yeah. i know when i first started writing about economics and i chat to parents at the school gate and they say you know what are you working on i'm writing a book about economics everyone goes <gasps> I, don't, I was never very good at maths, and I say, look, you know, the only maths in my book, the only numbers are the page numbers. We can all get this if we start with the fundamental values mm. of the living planet, of human values and connection. We now can create the beginnings of ideas and principles for 21st century economics that actually make sense. I'm glad you said about values, because to me, like, what is the goal of an economic system? If it's about GDP or enhancing profit or keeping interest rates low, like why is it that? And they're just measures, like they don't make any sense to a lot of people. I really love this video by Milton Friedman, who's talking about the wonders of the capitalist system and the free market system. And I'm not celebrating that, I'm not, I'm not uh, thinking it's a good thing, but it, he, he's shown all this stuff being made and he said, basically, I mean, he's the father of, um, I, I know you know, the yeah. father of neoliberalism. But what he says at the end of that video is, because the markets will en ensure that no power is concentrated, therefore no harm will be done. So Milton Friedman's vision was no power concentrated, no harm done. Like, I'm sure we all share that vision, right? Unfortunately, his economic system did the opposite. We've got eight people, I think, have got the, the same wealth as half, you know, half, half the world's population. And we're literally in the sixth mass extinction event. And also the finance system's already almost brought itself down. And I, I don't understand it at the minute, but the stocks and bond prices are tracking. The analysts are all nervous. It seems like we might be in another financial crisis. So it always seems to me that, you know, with, with the economic system, it's, nobody, nobody's here wanting to bring it down. It's bringing itself down, right? So, yeah. like, surely we can have some imagination to think about doing something better than what we're doing now. Yeah, and I think it starts with, in the first lecture that should be happening in universities around the world now, in the autumn, students are coming, they should start with a question, what is the purpose of the economy? Because if you don't know what the purpose is, how the heck do you know what success looks like? Exactly. They don't have that conversation, because like you said, GDP slips in. And the reason is because the early economists, back in the 1870s, they wanted to show economics as a science, as reputable as physics. And science doesn't have goals. That's far too subjective. So they stripped away any mention of goals, and like a cuckoo, GDP snuck into its place, and it becomes the implicit goals. When I speak to economic students and say, have you ever had a conversation about the purpose and the goal of the economy? And did you notice that GDP becomes this tacitly accepted, their jaw kind of, they just drop and they realize 
that they've accepted that without questioning it. So the first class should be, what is our planetary household and all her inhabitants and what is the goal of managing this well? What would that look like? And then let's devise economic systems and markets. I think there will be markets. It's an incredible mechanism. But there will also be the state and there'll be the household and there will be the commons. And we need to rebalance the relationships between them to pursue these goals that we must wear on our sleeves, right? Put your values on your sleeve, otherwise they're hidden deep in the mat of your model. And they're always there. Yeah. You can't take them out. It's a lie to say that this is a objective, value-free science. Rubbish. Yeah. A values are always there. Yeah. And then likewise with democracy, it's this idea that, you know, well, people think that democracy is about voting, which I find the most boring thing. I mean, I know that women fought for it, so I'm, I, you know, I do it. I do it by postal votes. So I can just get it out of the way and get on with my life because I don't have much faith in this system. In fact, um, one of the precursors to, um, to Extinction Rebellion, we made a film called 15 Ways to Fake a Democracy. Okay. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. It involves faking orgasms on the steps of the Houses of Parliament, <laughs> <laughs> which was a laugh. I, I think any, only people who understand some of the flaws in the economic system are going to understand some of the points we're making, but there, there are literally many ways in, this, in which this democracy is fake and many other versions of democracy that you can have. And I think we just seem to lack, like there was a lack of economic literacy that concerned me. There's a lack of democratic li literacy as well, do you think? No, I think that's right. And you, you took us back at the start to thinking about Athens and Athens is the cradle of democracy. And they only used elections to decide who would be there, uh, who, who would lead the army. The, the, really? Uh, yeah, the, uh, most of, uh, almost all of the positions of political power in Athens were selected by lot, by random selection. And gradually over time, you know, we, we've come to see democracy as elections, when historically democracy was associated with, with lot and rotation. The, um, the Athenians thought that elections led to oligarchy which we now know is true. So, <laughs> so you know, it's, it's really interesting that our sort of idea of what democracy is has changed over time and, and become synonymous with elections. I think that's really, really problematic. I really like what Howard Zinn said about this. He said, politics is what happens between elections. Yes, I think, that, yes I think that's right. I think that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. This is, the, this is the most political thing you can do, yeah. in my opinion, is get on the streets. But yeah. I thought it was a really smart move uh, when Roger Hallam, when he first put forward some of the ideas behind Extinction Rebellion, had this idea of the Citizens' Assembly yeah. would decide um, how we go to net zero carbon as, as rapidly yeah. as possible. Because it, one great function of it is literally to stop us having a big fight about it right now. Because there's sort of no point, in a way, is there? You're just having a random fight about this process or that thing or the other. And until somebody's got time to sit down with experts and make a decision then then I mean it's great to have debates so get me wrong but to make that about your movement yeah. rather than actually to bring forward new democratic forms and, and I think one of the one of the, the, the reasons that XR has thought about a citizens assembly is because if we look at the way that Parliament operates it operates on short-term electoral cycles it's very hard to make commitments over time for political parties yeah. you know if you think about the amount of special interest that influence parliamentarians in a sense what XR is doing I think very cleverly is saying look you know we know you're having trouble with this decision with yeah. dealing with this thing we've got this other way of doing politics yeah. which could do could do this differently and I think that's really, I mean, that's a powerful message to politicians. You know, you have, you've shown yourself to be unwilling and unable to do this. Yeah. We know a way of doing this democratically. And, yeah. I, and I think that has power. And I think for XR it's powerful as well to say, we don't know what the answers are either. Yeah. We need to bring people together. We need to develop public wisdom. And, you know, by bringing a diverse group of citizens together from all sorts of backgrounds, we actually get that public wisdom, which you don't get from Parliament. And it seems to me it's about ordinary British people feeling more confident in their own ability and not yeah. giving our power away to these other people, the power lies in the collective right. I really like what Dougal Hines said, who uh, went off as, a, as an environmental activist to Did the Dark Mountain. you spend time Mountain. in the bath with him as well? <laughs> I'd like to, he's lovely. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that, Dougal's wife. But, you know, he um, probably... <laughs> basically what he said was um, that in this time as we increasingly recognise that there's um, an emergency, there's two directions of travel because this democracy is not working for yeah, us. Yeah. Either we go in the direction of more democracy yeah, yeah. or less democracy. Yeah, yeah. And less democracy is fascism, essentially. Yeah, yeah, no, no, sure. And when you've got like a small band of elites proging the parliament and yeah. there's literally politicians saying they could start a civil contingency act or things like that, you know, th these, are the, these are the smells of fascism, no, uh, right? No, I, I, I mean, agree. And, and yeah. when you were talking about um, economy, 
a lot of this is about lack of imagination. So when people say we need more democracy or we need to do democracy better, they think, how can we just tinker with Parliament? Rather than thinking, actually, there are new ways of doing democracy, there are new institutions. And the kind of crisis we're facing can be a, you know, there can be a fantastic democratic response to that. There can be a sort of empowering of democracy, or as you say, it can be the, it can be the withering of democracy. And I think that's where we are. Yeah. And I think XR is making it very clear that this isn't just about a climate solution. It's about a way of doing, of living and being and doing democracy, doing the economy. And actually those two things are interrelated with each other. You know, the, it's a real mistake to try and think there's this one solution and we, yeah. we, we know what it is. Yeah, and we need to experiment. I always yeah. say 21st century economics will be practiced first and theorized yeah. later. And we'll yeah, yeah. figure out the practice by experimentation. And I think it's the true with democratic yeah. progress. Let's yeah. try lots of different forms. Yeah, yeah. Some of them won't work. Some of them will work. Let's learn from that and then keep evolving these no, kinds I, of institutions. I think, I think that's right. And you know, citizens' assemblies and the kind of the kinds of institutions like citizens' juries and you know, like that, that, that were precursors to it, they've only been around 20, 30 years. Yeah. 30, you know, so we've only really been practicing with them. And we, we really don't know how powerful they could be. I mean, I've, I've run and seen a lot of these things. And it's incredible the wisdom of the wisdom of ordinary people is is amazing and the way that people can work collectively together and you know we need some of that in our politics and we do yeah. it in law anyway yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a, a jury of your peers yeah, yeah, it yeah. Works. that's right that's right yeah, yeah. so i think the message is to really trust ourselves to experiment and to uh, move in the direction of togetherness that's what i reckon bring it on i like that thank you <laughs>